So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Seidel. So I am utterly convinced that Christian nationalism is the single greatest threat to our constitutional government, to a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. That is why I wrote The Founding Myth. For those of you who don't know or didn't hear Nick's definition of Christian nationalism, Christian nationalism is the idea that we are founded as a Christian nation, that our government was based on Christian or Judeo-Christian principles. And more importantly, that we have strayed from that foundation and that we have to get back to our godly roots, to our religious founding. Now, the real goal here is twofold. One, it is to privilege Christians with the law, to elevate Christians to a privileged status and everybody else to second-class citizen status. And also to make it so that to be a Christian is to be an American. And to be an American is to be a Christian. It is, they are actively trying to redefine what it means to be an American. So the goal is to do that and then to reshape the law accordingly. Now, before the 2016 election, Christian nationalism was an impotent sideshow. We had seen waves of Christian nationalism throughout American history. Uh, in the lead up to the Civil War, there was one. Uh, the 1950s, there was another one. But for the most part, it had, it had not really done a great job of seizing power. But that all changed in the 2016 election. The, the best indicator of a Trump voter in the 2016 election uh, was not being a racist or uh, race or religion, despite evangelicals supporting Trump in massive numbers. It was thinking that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. That was the best predictor of a Trump voter. So Christian nationalism was intimately tied in with Trump's election pitch. He tapped in to this undercurrent of Christian nationalism in a way that we had not seen in our lifetimes. And then he rode that into the most powerful office in the history of the world. And now, Trump and Pence and Betsy DeVos and the rest of the Christian nationalists in this administration are legislating that Christian nationalism. Uh, you are seeing this in a number of different areas. Uh, Nick already gave a great presentation on Project Blitz. That is an explicitly Christian nationalist campaign. Uh, but it's also at the federal level. The Muslim ban is a very good example of Christian nationalism written into law. Not only did that ban immigration from Muslim majority countries, it also favored immigration for Christians. Uh, everything pretty much that is going on at the Department of Education right now, under Betsy DeVos, is Christian nationalism. Uh, and and you know, the, one of the main goals here is actually to undermine and eventually destroy public education, uh, to force kids into private Christian schools. Uh, and they, they used to be very explicit about this. They've gotten cagier over the years. The child separation policy at the border, that is Christian nationalism. The White House learned to justify the child separation policy at the border with the Bible, specifically with Romans 13. They learned that in the White House Bible study. We know this. We've got the documents. I wrote an article for Think Progress about this. Uh, the opposition to gay marriage and LGBTQ rights is almost exclusively religious and largely Christian nationalists. Uh, the same thing for the attempts to seize back and control women's bodies and to erode their right to choose. Now, the one good piece of news here is that the political theology of Christian nationalism, the, the very identity of the Christian nationalist is based on this common well of lies and myths. And you've heard these all before. Uh, it's the idea that we are one nation under God. In God we trust, that the Declaration of Independence references God and Jesus four different times, that the founders prayed at the Constitutional Convention, that George Washington knelt in prayer in the snow at Valley Forge, that, we are based, that our laws are based on the Golden Rule and on the Ten Commandments. 
Now, all of those lies and myths are central to Christian nationalists' hold on power. Without that historical support, many of their policy justifications actually begin to crumble. And without that support, their entire identity will wither and fade. So their, their entire political ideology is actually incredibly weak because it is based on all these lies and myths. So that is the purpose of the founding myth. It's a, it's a simple, if a lofty goal. I am seeking to utterly destroy the Christian nationalist identity. <laughs> Now, it's not simply a refutation, the book is not simply a refutation of the idea that we are founded as a Christian nation. I'm sure many of you have been in debates about that very topic, uh, and there tends to be a fallback proposition that, that people rely on after you, for instance, maybe cite the Treaty of Tripoli, and it, it goes something like this. Well, I didn't mean we were founded as a Christian nation. What I really meant is that we were based on Christian principles, or that we were founded on Judeo-Christian principles. So that is the claim that I sought to investigate in the book. So the central question I ask is, did Judeo-Christian principles, whatever the hell those are, positively influence the founding of the United States of America? And the answer to that is no, they didn't. And in fact, it's a good thing they didn't because Judeo-Christian principles are fundamentally opposed to the principles on which this nation was built. There is such disagreement and conflict that it is fair to say, albeit bluntly, Christianity is un-American. So that is the argument that I make in the founding myth. It also happens to be the truth, so I've got that going for me. <laughs> and how, how many people here are, are former churchgoers? Okay, I apologize. If I, and if you have any episodes, you should feel free to run out of the room, but we are going to have a few readings today. <laughs> My, my publisher insists on it. So to make this argument that there's this fundamental conflict, I, I broke the book into, into four different parts. And part one is sort of our pre-constitutional history. Uh, it, I go over the, the Declaration of Independence and, and the four references that supposedly invoke God in the Declaration of Independence. I talk about the religion of the founding fathers uh, and whether or not that matters. I go over the idea that our nation was settled by people seeking religious liberty. How many people heard that in public schools or private schools? Not really true. Um, and I'm just going to read a, a, a short passage here from, from this because to me this is one of the most important parts of the book. Uh, so this is from part one, uh, and this is where I'm talking about the religion of the Founding Fathers. Though interesting, the battle over what the founders personally believed is irrelevant to the claim that our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. That the founders had personal beliefs about religion and God does not prove that they used those principles to found a nation. Those religious beliefs must be examined and compared against the principles that informed our constitutional design. So, for me, this is really, I love love to talk about the Founding Fathers. I love to talk about what they personally believed about God and Jesus and whether or not they were theists or deists or Christian. And if you give me a glass of your delicious Kentucky bourbon, I could do it for eight hours <laughs> easily. But it does not matter. And it's irrelevant to the central point. And when we engage on that argument, we're kind of giving away part of the game already. And it's far better for us to take a different tack and say, yeah, you know what, even if all the founders were Christians, so what? What does that prove, person who is claiming that we are a Christian nation? What does that prove? It gets you absolutely nowhere. So that's, that's just one part of part one. Part two is United States v. the Bible. Uh, this is me being a lawyer who thinks he's funny, but no lawyers are funny, so this is supposed to be like a case name, you know, like United States v. so-and-so. And in, in that section of the book, I actually go through individual biblical principles, and I compare them to America's founding principles. So things like the golden rule, uh, the idea of original sin, uh, hell, which is properly a Christian principle, not a Judeo-Christian principle. And I compare those to America's founding principles. 
And so I'm going to read briefly from uh, chapter 10 here. And chapter 10 is called Redemption and Original Sin or Personal Responsibility and the Presumption of Innocence. And again, remember what I'm trying to show. There's this fundamental disconnect between the principles of Christianity and the principles on which our nation was founded. The American justice system and our government and perhaps our entire society rest on the principle that people are personally responsible for their actions. The entire Christian religion is based on a singular claim that violates that principle of personal responsibility. The idea that Jesus died for your sins. Christianity's rejection of personal responsibility is actually twofold. First, a person is guilty of original sin simply because they were born. To believe this, you must accept not only that all humans descended from two originals that a God created for his garden, but also that all human beings are culpable for the actions of those two forebears whose disobedience was prompted by a talking snake and was committed millennia ago. Guilt without action is rare under our system of law, but it is the law for much of Christianity. Second, the sacrifice of Jesus means that one's sins are forgiven. This is vicarious redemption through human sacrifice. Jesus as a sacrificial scapegoat. Now, each of these ideas is repugnant to American principles in its own way. Original sin confers guilt without regard for personal actions, while vicarious redemption absolves that guilt through the torture and murder of another human being. So that's part two. Part three is where this book began. Uh, this book started as a law review article that just got really, really out of hand. <laughs> How many people have heard the claim that the United States is based on the Ten Commandments? And a bunch of people who didn't raise their hands also. So, um, <clears throat> This is a very, very popular claim. This is where this book began. Uh, th this, is, this claim has worked its way into Supreme Court decisions. And when I was getting my LLM, which is a pointless law degree that I didn't need to get but got after my JD, it... I, I was reading about these cases uh, and seeing a Supreme Court justice say, yes, of course the Ten Commandments influenced our law. And I thought, what? That can't be right. I'm, I'm going to investigate this. And it turns out, if you do that investigation, every single one of the Ten Commandments violates America's central founding principles. Yes, every single one. Even the ones that you're thinking of right now where you're thinking, yeah, but the, not that one because that one, hey, you're not allowed to murder anybody. Yes, that one too. But to understand why, you have to buy the book. I'm not going to tell you why on that one. Uh, what I will do is read from the first chapter of part three, which is chapter 13. And chapter 13 is a simple question. Which ten? The Ten Commandments, also known as the Decalogue, supposedly the most moral law known to humanity and supposedly authored by the biblical God himself, are not easy to find. They're not at the beginning of the Bible. God didn't give the rules to Eve and Adam even after their fall, nor did he give them to Noah after exterminating all human and animal life save Noah's crew. And Noah needed a bit of moral guidance. Noah's son Ham accidentally walks in on Noah drunk, naked, and passed out. Refusing to take responsibility for his frat boy behavior, Noah curses an innocent child, Canaan, Ham's son, and Noah's own grandson to a life of slavery for Ham's crime of seeing Noah naked. That was the only man the Jewish God thought moral enough to save from a worldwide flood. <laughs> Yahweh did not see fit to give out his laws, his most moral laws, if Christian nationalists are to be believed, until much farther along in the biblical storyline. The first set, there are four, doesn't appear until halfway through the second book of the Bible, Exodus. H.L. Mencken reportedly once quipped, Say what you will about the Ten Commandments, you must always come back to the pleasant fact that there are only ten of them. <laughs> if this wit does indeed belong to Mencken, then so does, the, so does the air, because there are not Ten Commandments. There are four different sets of Ten Commandments in any given Bible. And then different religions interpret those commandments differently as well. And these may seem like small religious differences, but the difference between don't murder 
and don't kill is the difference between being able to protect yourself if somebody breaks into your house at night and not. The difference between <laughs> graven images and idols, I don't actually know what it is, but I also don't care what it is, but it split the church in the 8th and 9th centuries. The church went to war. It had a civil war over this issue in the 8th and 9th centuries. It's called the iconoclast controversy. And that's because there's no such thing as a small religious difference. When you pair absolute certainty about the ultimate truth of the universe, I mean, you're guaranteed to have friction over any difference, no matter how seemingly small. So no such thing as a small religious difference. Anyway, that is the intro to the Ten Commandments chapters. And then I walk through every single one of the Ten Commandments and show why they are fundamentally opposed to the principles on which this nation was built. Now, the fourth part of the book, um, this is the part of the book that I was, I'm kind of bitter that I had to write this book, this part of the book, because the arguments are so bad that I'm trying to push back against here. I mean, and they're probably the arguments, unfortunately, that you hear the most. So part four uh, is called American Verbiage, and this goes over the argument by idiom. So this is from the intro to part four. In God we trust, one nation under God, God bless America. These tidbits are not historical so much as they are rhetorical. Their tardiness precludes any argument that they somehow prove the founding ideology, but it is worth analyzing how that verbiage entered the American vernacular because doing so reveals something interesting about Christian nationalism. Christian nationalists take advantage of times of fear and use them to impose their God on everyone else. When doing so, they often destroy earlier unifying messages. Now, Christian nationalists ignore this logic and recite these religious idioms each more delinquent relative to the founding than the next to bolster their argument. In each instance, the truant language entered our vernacular during times of fear and national crisis, during a war in one case, and in another case, at a time when witch hunters were looking for nonconformists and non-Christians while big business was peddling religion to repeal regulations. In the final instance, the intent was to cover the most notorious presidential crimes ever committed. I wrote that last sentence before the Mueller report was released, so <laughs> rain, rain of salt on that one, friends. But, but this is, I think, what makes the founding myth different. This is why this book is different than other books that have been released on this topic. You know, they, previous books have offered this gentle correction to the Christian nationalists. You know, here is what history tells us. Here's, here's what the founders actually said, and here's what they actually meant. But they've kind of left it at that. And, and correction is just not enough. Otherwise, we wouldn't have President Trump, right? It, pointing out errors and having the facts on our side is insufficient. So this book does that. It gives you those facts, but then it takes the next step. It goes on the offensive. This book is an assault on the Christian nationalist identity. Not only are Christian nationalists wrong, their beliefs and identity run counter to the ideals on which this nation was founded. They are un-American. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A, it looks like. Do you have a mic you want to do, or do you want to just... Uh... No. Okay, so if, if you've got a question, raise your hand. I'll call on you. I'll try to repeat it, or the gist of the question. Uh, and then I will be, actually I'm doing a panel, and then after that I will be happy to sign and sell books to anybody who wants one. Did, I see one. Did you have a hand? No? Okay. Really? I answered everything. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it I mean I, th I think things I think things are worse right now I think the, the reason that Christian nationalism has seen this resurgence is because there is this sort of there's this death of expertise there's this what I was just talking about which facts seem to matter less and less than everybody's got an opinion that's more important and that's one of the things that I'm really trying to do with the book the reason I call this un-American I mean this is meant to be a gut punch this is meant to go after something that they, it's a core piece of their identity. And it's 
Christian nationalism, again, to repeat what I said at the beginning, they are trying to make it so that to be an American is to be a Christian, and to be a Christian is to be an American. And we have to push back against that, that fundamental part of their identity. And I get that there's probably some reluctance from a lot of people in this room to, one, maybe even use the phrase, un, the word un-American, because there's an inherent value judgment built into that word. But we are in a fight for our values right now. I mean, Christian nationalism is dragging this country down a hole. And if we, if we don't engage on that level, we are going to lose. And this, the second thing that I'm trying to do with that is I'm trying to reclaim patriotism. Right? Patriotism has no religion. And I think when I say even the word patriotism right now, a lot, there's probably a visceral, a visceral revulsion for a lot of the people in this room. You are probably picturing, you know, your MAGA hot wearing uncle uh, who's on Facebook constantly spouting out ridiculous conspiracy theories. Uh, and I really want to push back against that idea and reclaim that for our side. I mean, one of, one of the truly unique things about America is the fact that we have a godless constitution. We were the first nation to do that. No nation had ever done that before. And we were the first nation to separate state and church. That had never, never been tried. The idea was born in the Enlightenment, but no nation had put that idea into practice until we did. That is, that is a, one of the only truly uniquely American things about our constitution. And we should be proud of that fact not seeking to undermine it, which is what, what Christian nationalists are trying to do. So I really think it's, um, it's critical that we try to reclaim patriotism and point out that patriotism has no religion. I saw some hands over here. Yeah. So I was at the debate in Louisville that you had, and I was wondering if, so I feel like the book will go, it, it might go over the heads or they'll look at the title and they'll decide not to read it. How would you heckle the average, uh, even though it's written down in all sorts of places, mm -hmm. and you still think that it's a Christian nation? Do you have any smaller, simpler things I can say? About yes. That? No, I mean, it's, it, it's a really good question. How do, you, how do you break this down so that you can have these arguments? Is, yeah, the question is basically, how do you break this down so you can have these arguments with, with the other side in simple ways and not have to say, well, just read this book because they're probably not going to read the book. Um, I mean, it's, it's a really great, great question. And for those of you who uh, didn't, hear, uh, didn't hear or didn't get to go, he mentioned the debate that I had um, with Mark David Hall that was in Louisville. Was that last week? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's going on C-SPAN tonight, so if you want to see it, you'll be able to go see it. Um, but if you notice, what I did in that debate was I didn't try to engage on the historical minutia. I didn't get into the debate over James Madison voting for the chaplains uh, during the First Continental Congress or during the First U.S. Congress. I stuck to the higher level argument, which is you cannot name a single Christian principle on which this nation was built. And the principles that you are going to name, life and liberty, are not Christian principles. Those are universal human principles. And I, so I give you all of those arguments in this book. Um, you know, uh, the Golden Rule is a great chapter. It's a very short, simple chapter that really hits um, the Christian nationalist tactic of claiming things that are not, are not theirs. Uh, like they will claim that the Golden Rule influenced the founding of the United States, which, and it, you can even concede that and then say, yeah, but that's not a Christian rule. That's not a Christian principle. That's a universal human principle. So one of the things I really try to do in the book is to give you better arguments. You see, there's two audiences to the book. You are one of the audiences, the secular, non-religious, atheist, agnostic, free-thinking Americans who are going out and having these debates is one. And then the, re the other section is the, the middle group of the country who may not realize what Christian nationalism is and that it is this massive threat to our constitution and to our, our government, uh, trying to convince them to help us push Christian nationalism back to the fringes from whence it came. Um, the, if you go away with just a few simple arguments from the book, one is... There is no freedom of religion without a government that is free from religion. 
if you follow me on social media or if you read anything I've written besides this book, you will see that I use that sentence everywhere. It is easy to remember and it stops and makes everybody think. There is no freedom of religion without a government that is free from religion. That is one of the best arguments for a secular government out there. It doesn't appeal to us because who cares, but it really does appeal to them. And, and we have to speak their language in some ways. And the, the second thing is patriotism really does have no religion. And I get into that a lot in the last chapter. But really, I mean, there are a number of arguments in here that I think you can turn around and use in these. And if you look for the high level arguments that I make, rather than getting into that historical minutia, you're gonna be better off. But if you're having a debate online and you can go pull up, you need a reference book, this is also your, your go-to. Here and then there. Sure. So the question was, is FFRF doing anything to build alliances with other groups that are affected by Christian nationalism? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, the, I, and I will say this too, the, the secular movement itself, American Atheists, American Humanists Association, Center for Inquiry, FFRF, Americans United, all of those groups are working a lot more closely together than in the past. Um, and we've been extend all of us have been extending our reach to potential allies and allies. Uh, it, it's been really an excellent evolution to watch. And I will uh, let me mention this too. If you do want to buy one of the books out there, um, they're twenty five dollars. But I'm not taking any of the money from this. All the money goes back to FFRF. I'm donating all my royalties from the book sales at events like this back to FFRF. So you're supporting the work that we do at FFRF by getting a copy of the book. So in the back there, yeah. Uh, it seems like one of the uh, important points is that keeping government and religion separate is also in the best interest of religion. Mm -hmm. sure. what, what, what are some good, pithy things you can... I mean, the... I mean, that the, the separation of state and church is absolutely in the benefit of religion, in particular minority religions. But again, there is no freedom of religion. They care about the freedom of religion without a government that is free from religion. That is the thing that lands most. And what can, how can you demonstrate that? I mean, it, it, so one effective talking point, if you get into the, get a little bit deeper with them, is look, well, if you want the government to be able to promote religion, or if you want the machinery of the state to, uh, you know, aid a religion, well, which, which religion? Which religion is going to be favored? And if you want to say Christians, well then, okay, well, which Christians? Are we talking Mormons? Are we talking Christian scientists? Are we talking Catholics? Are we talking evangelicals? Uh, we'll aid all of them. Well, how are we going to divide up the aid? Is it going to be by number of adherents or number of churches or a number of voters? How are, how are we going to do this? You know, where, where is this going to fall? And you, it pretty quickly, by asking questions like that, you, they will come to realize how difficult it is to have anything other than a government that supports many religions that they fundamentally disagree with, that tell them they are going to hell, uh, which is usually a pretty good emotional argument. And we should be <laughs> use, using some of those, too. In the back there. One more. One more. Yeah, yeah, in the back there, yeah. On uh, what you're just saying, my rant is all this in the decline of like the Middle East. After the Christians get to the course of themselves as the official religion, then how long will they start to run before they start killing each other to establish the official religion? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a really good point. So and this is something, the, the founders talked about the torrents of blood. This was a phrase James Madison used. The torrents of blood that were spilled in the old world when religion was united with government. And the, the problem with that argument is that state church separation has been so damn effective and so successful that we don't have that history to turn and point to the way the founders did. And it's not as effective. And because it's been so successful, we've kind of gotten, as a country, complacent about state church separation. And, and so it, it, that argument is intellectually yes, but it doesn't have the oomph that it should because we're victims of our own success. And I, I, have, to, I have to leave it at that, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we, I, I'm happy to chat more with you afterwards, okay? 
And if you, if you didn't get to ask your question, I will be out there. I'm happy to chat more. And, and I apologize to anybody I didn't get to.